Hello there, friends, and welcome back to more Bravely Default. Last time, we began exploring the Vampire Castle and finding these very interesting paintings and having thought-provoking questions and conversations with our uh, gracious host here, Lester De Rosso, who we originally thought was a vampire and was an immortal who was sort of plaguing the lands of Eternia, but instead, no. One, he may be an immortal, but he's not a vampire, and two, He's been going on this large 2400 year long revenge spree against the Crystal Orthodoxy. He's not plaguing the lands of Eternia, he's been helping it so far. And speaking of the Orthodoxy, we haven't uh, had them painted in the best light the past few uh, episodes. And it's been very interesting to see the history of that religion, and how it came to be, and how it has dominated the planet for so long. But before we continue on, Let's go ahead and check up on Narende Village. First things first, uh, the K-Part shop has been upgraded, so we got our nice bonuses there. And, unfortunately, no trader bonuses. So I think today we're going to be upgrading the accessory shop to level 9 for the Golden Egg. This item's fairly interesting and a bit unique, so I'm going to go ahead and grab one. Obviously, I probably will not be able to actually buy this for a while, but I want to go ahead and grab it just in case. And let's go ahead and press onward. So continuing the Vampire Castle, this is the fifth floor. This is already one of the longest dungeons we have we've had the uh, ability to explore. And imagine if we actually had enemy encounters still on. I uh <laughs> I would not like that. Magic armlets. Let's see here. Greatly raises mind stats. Let's go ahead and put that on our boy Ringabell as he's currently equipping all of the mind increasing items I've got so far. As the blessed shield scales based off of your equipment, but not your actual uh, abilities or stats. So keep that in mind. Well, actually, it kind of scales off of st abilities. It's a little weird. Uh, I think that leads into where I want to go. So let's go ahead and just loop around real quick. See what happens over here. Actually, no, that leads to a treasure chest. Okay, so then I'm going to head back for that one real quick. Um, discussing the Vampire Castle's aesthetics real quick, I want to go ahead and mention that I, I'm a very big fan of the whole paintings idea. Uh, I'm a big fan of the the pink flame candles. I'm a big fan of pretty much, pretty much everything in here. Lamia's tiara here. Um, though, I do have one personal gripe with this. Now... I I don't think I can really blame the game on this front, or any of the developers really, but it's more of a personal thing. I really wish this dungeon had unique music. It's just utilizing, you know, the fairly standard dungeon theme, but I really, really wish this dungeon and even Attorney and Central Command had their own unique song. It's a personal thing, but everything else about this dungeon I really, really like. Battlefield landscape? It represents the long and hard-fought war between the Orthodoxy and we denizens of darkness. For 500 years, my thirst for vengeance remained unsated. Uh. It had also been 500 years since the Orthodoxy had been founded. The world was in the midst of an age of seafaring and piracy. Compared to the great exchange of ideas and information, the once hallowed orthodoxy began to lose its luster. The authority of the Grand Patriarch and the orthodoxy itself began to wane. Fearing irrelevancy, the Grand Patriarchy acted rashly to regain its authority. This led to the unusual decision to select a commoner, the gifted young Yulyana, for an important task. Yulyana? Say, Juliana? Yes, indeed. At age 20, the young Juliana became High Inquisitor of the Crystal Orthodoxy. <laughs> it's hard to believe he ever was young. <laughs> it was no laughing matter, for there was no one more skilled at rooting out enemies of the faith than he. The shadowy ones, those who had been working against the Orthodoxy, were crushed by the host he led. 
In the several decades that saw him age, I cannot count the number of times we have crossed swords, he and I. In the great battle waged on the Karka Plain, the might of our clashing forces rent the very earth into a vast rift. You mean the rift under Ison Bridge? In the battle at the foot of Mount Fragmentum, our armies smote the mountain to its very roots. So that's how that ravine was created. And in the battle fought on the Harina Plain, the once fertile earth was reduced to desolation. The loss of that fertile plain is believed to have ushered in the downfall of the Harina Dynasty. To think any sort of battle could change the face of the earth so. We fought our final battle 1800 years ago on the Norende Heights in the land of Kaldisla. The Norende Heights? That's where the Great Chasm opened up! In the end, Yulyana, High Inquisitor of the Crystal Orthodoxy, utterly defeated me. Lord De Rosso, leader of the Shadows. You were defeated? But you're here with us today! Yes, well, there was more to that final battle than meets the eye. You see, I ceded the glory of victory to young Yulyana that day. I say young in my reckoning, for he was already 100 then. Yulyana returned triumphantly to Eternia with what he claimed to be my remains. What he brought them was not human. And when the Templar attacked the Head Temple 15 years past, it is said they found my tomb deep underground. Ever dreading the darkness and my return, the Orthodoxy kept those duplicitous remains under Arcane Seal for over 1,000 years. Hmm. Tis a tale replete with irony, is it not? Lord De Rosso's war landscape. It's hard to imagine a war lasting 500 years. I agree, Ring of Bell. That is crazy. But I want to go ahead and take a quick second to just say how awesome it is to... Even though we, we kind of got small snippets that those land masses were unnatural, that we finally get confirmation that the land under the, under the Eisen Bridge, the Harina Desert by Anchime, like, all of that is unnatural and was created by this huge scale, like, this large scale war. Oh my goodness. Yeah, to just, to even think about a war that size just boggles my mind. And to think that Lord De Rosso and Sage Yulyana were old enemies? Oh my goodness. It's a lot to take in, man. I mean, that sort of explains, I guess, a little bit why Sage was uh, on the Council of Six. Oh, hey, a Mega Elixir. I mean, he had been he had been around for a long time, and he and he and Lord De Rosso had connections somewhat, and you know that was. That was uh, probably their main reason for being on the Council of Six together, but Lord the Rosso conceded victory to, say, Yulyana, and Yulyana didn't uh, actually kill him and apparently uh, falsified his death. Did they make a deal or something? I'm sure it'll be answered here fairly soon. But hey, another painting. Let's go ahead and check it out. That is... Say Juliana! Yes, indeed. No one would mistake such a man for young now. Having put down the blood-sucking Lord De Rosso, Bane of the Crystal Orthodoxy, he became the first ever commoner to become an archbishop. Perhaps it was a small honor they threw his way, for he was already 101 years old, and would not long count among the living. That makes it sound... despicable. Agreed. The truth is, however, that was when Yulyana's plot was at its most clever. The Sage's plot? 
what was he plotting? He was taking measures to separate you Vestals and the faithful among the people from the Orthodoxy's corruption. After serving some 80 years, he had witnessed firsthand how corrupt the institution had become. Should nothing be done, it would not be long before the putrid poison would do harm to the most innocent of the faith. So it was he vowed to rid the orthodoxy of the source of this poison, the concentration of power. But how? For the great feat of defeating me, Yulyana had been made Archbishop, but in name only. But such was not key to his plot. Timing was the key. The proper time to separate the Vestals and the Faithful from the Orthodoxy. And just what timing would that be? The great upthrust of the Eternian Highlands. At the time, the Highlands were not so formidable as they are today. But a colossal movement of earth and rock thrust the highlands to lofty heights, thereby isolating Eternia from the world. Hold on a moment. He was waiting for the earth to move? How could he have known when such an event would take place? I shall tell you in time. For now I will say this. Yulyana bided his time till the orthodoxy was cut off from the world. And at last, it happened. The Highlands Ringing Eternia did thrust up to about half its height today. The Orthodoxy ruled Eternia now found itself completely isolated, for this was an age preceding the airship. And while the Earth Crystal remained in their keep, control of the crystals of fire, water, and wind was returned to their respective temples. This what you believe to be the true form of crystallism is the fruit of Yulyana's efforts. That was the sage's doing? I won't ever call him a miserable old lech again. Sage? A portrait of the Archbishop. He looks just as he does today. Save for that elaborate attire. So, thanks to Yulyana's efforts, separation of powers were created in the Orthodoxy, creating the more modern version we see today, where it's not ruled by a, by a single archbishop or a patriarchy, it's ruled by individual vestals in their temples. It's really cool to think that the slimy old lech or a uh, perv that <laughs> we, we kind of know him to be was such an influential figure in making the orthodoxy the i wouldn't say fully benevolent but a better faith to follow that we see today it's really cool what is that glowing jewel-like object i could swear i've seen something like that before I believe you have seen a similar sight countless times. It is known as an asterisk. An asterisk? As in those objects we possess? Yes, indeed. The second stage in Yulyana's plot against the Orthodoxy's authority was to deprive them of the power to grant vocations. Grant vocations? I'm afraid I don't follow. Before Yulyana intervened, special approval was required to change vocations within the Crystal Orthodoxy. In this way, the institution grew rich through fat profits they called alms. Oh, so the Orthodoxy cornered the job market and the fees to participate therein? In layman's terms, yes. But Yulyana exposed this fact before the reigning Grand Patriarch. It was then that Yulyana approached panicked high officials and the Grand Patriarch himself with a proposal of pure genius. He showed them a stone known as an asterisk, saying the granting of vocation should be based on it, overseen by the Orthodoxy. Those who sought such vocations would apply to the Orthodoxy and pay a fair price, 
Anyone with the means to pay could thus learn a new job. That's no different from the old system where people had to pay alms. No different indeed. But the Grand Patriarch and his officials had not but the material profits of the Orthodoxy in mind. Hence, they accepted Yulyana's proposal without question, even appointing him to the important position of overseeing the new asterisk system. I fail to see how that really changed anything. Well, it did far more than you would guess. For he was the only one who knew how to make the asterisk stones. Why, that wily old fox? So it was Yulyana robbed the orthodoxy of its authority to grant jobs and took it for himself. What of the orthodoxy's profits? Wouldn't they demand Yulyana transfer the proceeds to their coffers? Yulyana was long gone. Abandoning the seat of Archbishop, he fled with his knowledge of the Asterisk craft. He also took arms and armor the Orthodoxy had seized from around the world, items of such power that their use was forbidden. He took them all and sealed them away in a hidden location. They now lie secreted away against the day the Orthodoxy's tyranny or some other impending doom threatens the people. He then hid himself in Yulyana Woods until those who knew him reached the end of their natural lives. But that did not take long, for I led the forces of the shadows to ensure their swift demise. I had always believed the Crystal Orthodoxy required not but the Crystals, the Vestals, and the Faithful. With the institution free of corruption, I returned to my homeland of Eternia after a 700-year absence. Where my family's castle once stood, I built a fortress of ice from whence I have been watching over the Orthodoxy's head temple. Meanwhile, Yulyana retired to that land to tend to the Vestals, but you know of that better than I. Say, Yulyana. Asterisk painting. Sage Yulyana created asterisks to chip away at the Crystal Orthodoxy's authority. Oh, that's so cool. The fact that Sage created asterisks to basically isolate the professions and abilities of the Orthodoxy to limit their power. Oh my goodness, I love that so much. I mean, we barely knew anything really about the orthodoxy and how jobs worked and whatnot, but it's just so cool to see all of this. Also, we got the Lilith's Rod, which is a rod that if you utilize it as an item, will cast a spear. Uh, I'm not really going to need that, but I'll go ahead and equip it anyways, as it is a fairly strong rod. Um, and we have made it to our adventurer pal here. Before we continue forward, I think it'd probably be best if we go ahead and set up some stuff for us here. Um, for Agnes, I think I'm going to go ahead and put Miscellany on her. Actually, you know what? I'll keep I'll keep Time Magic on her. I have an idea of what I want to utilize her Time Magic for, so I'll go ahead and do that. Uh, I think in terms of support abilities, everyone's fine. Ring a bell? He has no real use for White Magic right now. So I'll go ahead and equip Medication on him. And then Tiz, I've gone back and forth whether or not I want to keep Piracy on him right now. And I think I will. I have an idea of what I want to do if this doesn't work out. But for right now, piracy will uh, be my uh, choice of ability. And then in terms of equipment, I think everyone is perfectly okay the way they are. Yeah, it looks good. And then if we talk to our adventurer pal, it only gets worse from here on in. Of course it does. Of course it does. Can't be that easy. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and buy like four more Phoenix Downs just to... Make sure that I, I'm doing this right. Uh, there's a f I have eight Fulman shards and eight insect antennas. I think that's fine. Um, I'm tempted to grab some glitter bugs here. I'll grab like seven of them. I don't I don't think I need too many of these, but just in case, 
glitter bugs, why not? And then, I think in terms of everything else, I think I'm pretty okay. In terms of gear, obviously, I don't think there's anything really worth purchasing. I could grab a bloody shield, but I don't I don't think I'm really going to need it. I mean, our defenses aren't exactly the best, but I, I think I'll be okay. I don't think I need any of these. Hmm. I'm tempted to, but yeah, no. And then, let's go ahead and take one last look at my current equipment. Hyper Bracers is the uh, super strong strength increasing accessory. Hermes Shoes is the greatly raised agility accessory. Magic Armlets is the greatly raised mind accessory. And Power Bracers, unfortunately for Tiz, is the basic strength accessory. I could probably put something else on him, but I don't, I don't really think I need to. I think this is fine. If I had to make any other suggestion, I would probably say equip either a rebuff locket or a physical defense increasing uh, piece of equipment. But yeah, I think we're okay. So we're going to go ahead and save up one last time. And then see what lies over here. Hello there, Lord Deroso. I commend you for making it this far. Oh, no more paintings? The final painting lies beyond this throne. I shall reveal it to you if you defeat me in battle. What? The last test is a test of strength. I shall only reveal the painting to those whom I deem worthy. One might also say that there is no need for those who are unworthy to lay their eyes upon it. But be forewarned, I am a formidable foe. I trust you are well prepared. Let us do battle. Lord De Rosso the Vampire, or like a self-made vampire. He is a fairly difficult boss. His stats will be on the right side of the screen right now. Lord De Rosso is a physical-focused attacker, uh, being able to absorb our stats, BP, HP, or MP, but also being able to throw a lot of physical-based attacks at us, and some magic attacks, so we got to be prepared for both uh, avenues. His main weakness is light, though if you saw that I put salve making on Ring of Bell, you know that we're most likely just going to make our own weaknesses for him. The biggest thing with this encounter is I want to make sure that my speed is faster than his. So I'm actually going to be casting Hastiga first, thing, first and foremost, as this will give us the largest speed bonus I can get. Um, and then for Ring of Bell, we're gonna have actually we're gonna have everyone else default. We want to be very careful here. We're gonna slow down time here. This gives us a huge speed increase. There's Gravaga. That is a that is a, a set amount of damage to everyone, and it does roughly about 80%, 75% of your uh, maximum HP if it lands. Though it does have a chance of missing. Um, there's a reason why I put the Hermes shoes on Onyx right there. I want to make sure that my supports can actually outspeed him. Uh, for Idia, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go ahead and put the Thundaga uh, thing on, and then for Onyx, I think I'm actually gonna go ahead and have her default. Mm, is this a good idea? No. No, I'm going to go ahead and have her utilize Got Your Back to increase her physical defense. As I'm not really that afraid of uh, his magic damage. His Gravica is his only real means of doing magical damage to us. And it does percentage-based HP, so I don't really need to worry about increasing our defenses because it really wouldn't matter. And then Tiz, I'm actually going to go ahead and utilize Shin Smash to lower his own his speed. We do have that uh, slow parry, but I don't want to worry. I don't want to rely on that. The Shin Smash, speed down. Bone Crush. That Bone Crush is an attack. It's a fairly unique attack, as it is is the damage that it deals to you is based on how much the target's HP uh, is is gone. I guess is the best way of explaining it. So, for example, if I if Idia is at half HP, it'll do half of her missing HP, which will instantly kill her. But if she has no missing HP left, then it won't do any damage, which is a pretty cool gimmick, I guess. Uh, for Anyas, we're gonna go ahead and increase our physical defense again. Ring a bell. Let's go ahead and have you defend. Actually, no. Let's go ahead and have you 
uh, create a weakness for us. Let's go ahead and put on a insect antenna, and then a full moon shard. There we go. And then Tiz, we're gonna go ahead and have. Oops, didn't want to do that. There we go. And then Tiz, let's go ahead and just very slowly begin to whittle down Deros' defense. Get that defense up there. There's the Lightning Bane. Get him weaker to lightning damage. There's Gravica again. Only hit Agnes, that's okay. We're gonna have Idiot default one more time. Agnes, we're gonna have you default so we can build your BP. Ring a bell, we're gonna have you heal Agnes. And then Tiz, we're gonna have you slowly whittle down his physical defense again. I'm wary of a few things here. There's Bone Crush, which is not gonna do any damage to us, which is perfectly okay with me. There's a few things that I'm worried about here, but I don't. I, I, ideally, uh, <laughs> I don't. I don't get uh, too cocky here. I'm actually not going to fully brave with Idiot here, as Deroso can actually steal our BP, and if he decides to attack Idiot with that, I don't want to put her too far into the negative. Uh, Anya, we're going to utilize Hastega again. Ring a bell, going to default, and then Tiz. Let's go ahead and just throw two double damage at it. Hmm. Actually, real quick, yeah, let's go ahead and do our two double damages. And then I'm gonna go back to Agnes's turn. And it'll be a Hastega, but I'm also going to do a Love Power to increase our physical attack. There we go. And since she has the Hermes shoes, she'll probably act first. There we go. We're also gonna get our special moves up here. Moon Shadow. This is gonna do a lot of damage. Boom. And off we go. Let's speed things up. Double damage. Gonna do quite a bit of damage. There's Teroso's physical attack. That's quite a bit of damage. Just about 2,000 damage. It's quite a bit. Uh, we're going to have Agnes actually uh, utilize Quick, which is going to be my... Which is the biggest reason why I wanted to utilize Time Magic. We're gonna speed things up here. Quick increases her hit count. There's Battle Thirst. That drains her BP. I am going to have every single person default here. As soon as he utilizes Battle Thirst, Deroso is going to utilize his strongest attack, Energy Burst, a physical attack to every single party member. That is a crap load of damage. And then he's going to immediately try to utilize Bone Crush, which we're going to make sure that <laughs> that doesn't happen to us. Um, so we're going to speed everyone up again with Hastaga, and then we're going to uh, put on our physical defense boosts. And then Ring a Bell, we're going to have everyone, he's going to heal everyone up. And then Tiz, we're gonna brave twice. Remove his physical defense, and then double damage. Speed everything up. Ideally, this all goes out on in time. He loses his lightning weakness, which is a little annoying, but that's okay. There's our blessing, get everyone up to full HP as soon as possible. As he immediately goes for Battle Thirst, which is gonna drain our BP again, we're gonna default. Because he's gonna go for this again, Energy Burst. That's a lot of damage. Every single time he utilizes Battle Thirst, he's going to immediately Energy Burst. So you have to play around that fact. We're going to Brave again with uh, Anya's here. And we're going to increase our physical defense and we're going to increase our speed again. I do not want those to be uh, dropped. Then Ring a Bell, we're going to Brave twice. Because if he utilizes Bone Crush on anyone here right now, they're all dead. Well, at least that target is dead. So we're going to default. Actually, Tiz, I'm fairly, I'm feeling fairly confident. So let's go ahead and lower his physical defense again, and then we're going to lower his speed. We'll set up another special move here fairly soon. But this is kind of our dance: is we're going to be managing our HP and dealing damage to him whenever we can. There's, there's Bone Crush. Yep. If, yep. If he utilized that, we would have all been dead right there. Um, so we need to reapply our lightning weakness while we still can. I think for right now, Idia, I'm going to have her reapply her Thundaga because I'm, I'm assuming it's probably going to run out here fairly soon. And then we'll have Anya slowly work on the physical attack uh, increases there. Ring a bell, we, we will compound ourselves a vulnerable to lightning ability, and then tis default. There we go. Lightning Bane. As we do lightning, battle thirst. Okay, we're going to have to default again. There's the counter. Thankfully, uh, <laughs> counter still work with that. Let's default. Uh, okay. Energy burst. Oh my goodness, dude. Ah, uh, that, that moves. <laughs> it's so, it makes me so wary. Uh, let's go ahead and f power physical attack up or crit rate. 
Hmm. Let's do let's do physical attack up. Let's continue to do moon shadow. And then we'll attack with Idia. And then Anyas. Let's brave twice. I'm gonna keep his speed up as much as possible. And then we will also have her quick Idia. And then ring a bell. We obviously need to make sure our HP is as high as possible. Hopefully ring a uh the Rosso doesn't go for another drain here. I really hope he doesn't. And then We'll have... Actually, yeah, okay. What we'll do, we'll have Tiz Moonshadow. And then we'll have him... Uh, we'll just have him regular attack. And then we'll go up to Idia and make her Moonshadow Breaking Wave. Oh, that's right. I, I, I've got to do all of her actions again. There we go. Breaking Wave and then attack, attack, attack. Okay, that looks good. All right, let's go. Haste to And then quick... This will increase her uh, attack rate, which will increase her attack power tremendously. Take him down, Idia. Oh, that looks so cool. 9,162. It didn't get the crit, which is okay. We'll just speed things up. See, look at that damage. The quick bonus is insane. There's the blessing on our heels. And then Moon Shadow from Tiz. This will give us a lot of bonuses, as you can, as you can see. There's a crit. Look at our critical percent rate. A thousand percent. Bone crushed. No damage. Um, I'm actually going to go ahead and default with everyone except for Anya. So I'm going to have her increase our physical defense. And I'm going to have Ringabell re-up his compound. Because I'm afraid of battle thirst. I don't want anyone to lose their BP. Gravica. Alright, alright. Let's have Idiot attack a little bit. We're going to have Anyas re-up our speed. We're going to have ring -a bell heal us up. And then we're going to have Tiz, uh... We'll go ahead and have Tiz just throw himself a turbo ether. And then a double damage. There we go. Speed everyone up. Here's our regular attacks coming out. There we go. It also has a lot of HP, so this is, this is a long-winded encounter. Battle Thirst, okay. Oh, Idia's in the negative. Okay, well then, she's probably gonna go down here. Energy burst. Yeah, 4,700 damage on that. Sheesh! Okay, uh, let's go ahead and... S uh, we'll get, we'll, what we'll do is we'll get Idia up with Anyas, and then we'll have her haste again. Again, we're running out of MP here with Anyas, but that's okay. And then we're going to have Ring -a Bell rejuvenate. And then... His default. Get the speed up on everyone. And then Ring of Bells Rejuvenate is going to give us a lot of extra MP and BP back as well. Plus a full heal. There we go. Now we can go on the offensive once more. Obviously we lose our B uh, we lose our uh, extra bonuses. That'll be okay. Uh, I actually don't think any of us are gonna live this. We might not live this one, guys. Energy burst, don't kill us! Oh my goodness! Holy crap! Okay, okay, we, we need to recover this fast. All right, we're going to have Anyas get everyone up, Hastega again, and then we're going to have her utilize Got Your Back. Again, oh my goodness, look at that damage. Ring a bell, heal everyone up. Actually, we'll go ahead and have him brave twice, heal everyone, and then set his weakness back to lightning. And then Tiz, we will go ahead and default again. I do not want him to accidentally kill Deroso, as again, I don't have eyes on his HP, I do not want to actually screw something up here. Let's speed things up. We've seen everything he can do. There's both. Oh, never mind. <laughs> oh my goodness. Wow. His uh, Bone Crush outsped me. That's impressive. I think that's our uh, first real loss on an encounter. Well, I will. Uh, I'll see you back whenever uh, I don't get destroyed by DeRoso, I guess. I've always thought whenever Idia says so long that she was always saying go long. Like she was asking them to go long for a, like a football throw or something. It was, I don't know why, but I was like, good job, DeRosa, you caught the ball. Good job, buddy. How can this be? The um 
immortal Lester de Rosso has been defeated. Hey, that went much better. I just had to commit a lot more resources to increasing my physical defense. No EXP for this encounter, actually. You only get JP, which is uh, pretty interesting, I guess. But, you know, I'll take it. She gained a job level and learned redoubled effort. And Rigobald gained a job level and learned Holy One. That is a really good ability that I'll definitely be utilizing. And we, of course, got a Mega Elixir for our troubles. Now, De Rosso was a member of the Council of Six, so of course we obtain the Vampire Asterisk. The Blue Mage, I mean, <clears throat> Vampire, absorbs stats and abilities when attacking, and they learn the abilities of monsters, and they favor daggers, rods, and staves. Their specialty is Genome Drain, and their job command is Vampirism. The Vampire stats are very similar to the Red Mage or the Spellfencer, being mostly above average in every category, and kind of can slot themselves into any role you want in, their, in your party. Their armor's attitudes are primarily focused on rod staves and daggers, having S in all three, but also having an A in swords, B in axes and spears, and C in knuckles. They can pretty much utilize any weapon you want them to. It's pretty cool. In terms of their armor aptitude, they actually have a large affinity towards shields, although heavy armor like the helms and armor, not so much. The Vampire is our ability learning job, as you can go around the world map and learn the abilities of monsters to help you in combat. And the quality of those abilities vary from eh, not so great to some of the most overpowered and useful abilities in the game. Very worth it to pick up. And outside of that, the, the Vampire has the ability to absorb stats and HP, BP, or even MP from their opponents. They can remove status effects or take them for themselves. The Vampire also has access to status ailments, as we can see here. They have access to charm. The Vampire can kind of do it all, another example of our jack-of-all-trades. Though, I can guarantee you, the Vampire has a lot more mastery over what they can do versus something like the Red Mage or the Freelancer. This job is a formidable uh, addition to your team, especially if you take the time to go and learn some of its more powerful abilities. Really awesome addition, and I'll be giving this job a lot of love. I am a man of my word. Behold, the final painting. If we speak to Lester again, he says, I grow weary. I bid you, leave me in peace. Alright, well then let's go see this final painting, shall we? This painting... It is the angel descended from the heavens during my final battle against Juliana. An angel? When we last did battle 1800 years ago, the battle raged 100 days. The mountains of Norende rent asunder. Knowing the battle was reaching its end, I mustered the last of my strength to cast my greatest of spells. As my final attack surged forth, the angel did descend from the skies over Norende. Are you sure it was an angel? Verily so, for there are no other words to describe her. For a moment, Yolyana and I stood captivated. Before we realized it, our struggle was forgotten. We both tended to the angel. But the angel lost her light. Her wings were shattered and her body torn asunder. There seemed little hope she would live. When she came to her senses, she trembled with fear. Yet with little remaining strength in her body, she made unto us an appeal. What appeal? What did the angel say to you? Here she passed from this world. She slipped in and out of consciousness over many a day. In between ever-growing periods of unconsciousness, 
It was all she could do to mutter incoherently. A trap most vile, such a fool am I, the warriors of light, if it's not too late. These she would repeat over and over. When she did come to her senses, she would speak of the calamity that had befallen her. She spoke of how Luxendark was on the brink of doom, and spoke with precision of the events that has heralded its coming. She herself was surprised to find that she knew of details of our past, and events of the future as well. The struggle between the old faith and orthodoxy, the tragedy that would befall my family, my immortality, even events of the distant future. The distant future? Yes, for the angel spoke of events that have not come to pass even now. Events that await you in your future. She told of a bringer of evil who would appear in the guise of one friendly to the Vestals and seduce them into unleashing chaos in the name of awakening the crystals. This evil one would destroy Luxendark by piercing the boundary that protects this world and the opening of a great rift that sunders the earth shall herald its coming. The Great Chasm. The angel told of many other omens ere the great chasm would open. The light of earth shall raise up the north, and a deathly plague shall cover all the lands. Then shall a great rift rend the earth. She then entrusted me with a certain task, one that only an immortal such as I could fulfill. What sort of task could only an immortal fulfill? That I cannot say for she swore me to secrecy, but thereupon she quietly passed from this world. For three days and three nights, my former mortal enemy Yolyana and I spoke of what had transpired. Ultimately, we vowed to join forces to prepare for the coming doom of which the angel had foretold. of the angel. It all started with this fateful meeting. All of this. All of the events we have heard of here in the Vampire Castle, from De Rosa's story, his upbringing, to the forming of the Orthodoxy, to the tale of Yuliana and the asterisks, and finally to the angel and the war that was ended with her descent and death her telling of the future of an evil one who would bring about the end of the world. This is a lot to take in, and it's something to keep in mind as we begin the final chapters of our journey here. If I had to say one thing that was going through my head when I was first playing through this segment of the game, I just have to say why was this not the in the actual playthrough of the game? Why was this not in the main story? This is all optional. This story, DeRosa's life story, the story of the angel and whatnot, these are all important points in this in this game's narrative, and it's all optional. What we have heard today is some of the most important lore dumps that we will obtain about this game and the story moving forward. And we should take everything that we have learned here to heart as we continue our, in our journey. So, next time on Bravely Default, we're going to be wrapping up some loose ends, tackling some jobs that I either haven't given a lot of spotlight to or that we recently got and wanted to talk about but never really got the good chance to and then we will be looking at um setting up our team for one last little grind set to get our jobs to where i want them as we're seeing a lot of ones that i am not a big fan of but i want to increase some of those numbers but then after that we're going to be completing our journey by going to the holy pillar and hopefully bringing this all to a close. 
So, with that said, I'll see you soon.